Hello. And hi, Liz. I'm Tom Jones, and this is uh, Austin Parker. Coming at you live from, well, I am in gorgeous upstate New York. And, and I'm in Vancouver, BC, in Canada. Um, I hope people are having a wonderful day wherever you're located. Um, I know that it's getting a little late for those of you on the East Coast. So let's go ahead and get started with this workshop. Um, this yes. is a interactive 90 minute workshop. Um, you should expect, well, I presume, you know, you have a laptop or, or a computer because otherwise you wouldn't be watching the Zoom webinar. Um, so we're going to offer you the chance to interact with the Open Telemetry project. But first of all, let's tell you a little bit about what is, what's, it, what's it about and what are we going to cover today? Yes, so we're going to start off and tell you a little bit about observability, how, what Open Telemetry is and how it relates to it. Um, a lot of the sort of core concepts that you need in order to understand open telemetry. And then finally, we'll get around to actually using it, instrumenting some software and sending your data places. So first off, um, I'd love, we would love to hear from people in the chat. So we're going to ask a couple questions. Um, you can also here. raise your hand. Uh, there's yes, a virtual also... raise your hand button in the Zoom webinar. Uh, yep. So Just uh, my... raise your hand if in the Zoom webinar if you write software. Uh, of any kind. Give people a couple minutes to find that button. Three, four, five. It's creeping up. Six. Yep. Good, 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 okay. good. Seven. Okay, good chunk of people here. Yeah. How about if you operate software? Are you kind of a, an opsy, more of an opsy person? You deploy things, you, you do builds. Maybe you do both. Maybe you're in DevOps or your SRE. Okay, fair number of people. These amount. Yep. All right. Next one. Who has used any kind of distributed tracing before? Uh, Zipkin or maybe a home brewed tracing system. Okay. Well, that's more than I expected. Uh, we usually yeah. get pretty low numbers. Like it's usually less than ten percent. Like usually we find that people are tracing newbies, which is you know exciting, but also, yeah. Uh, what about Open Census? Anyone? Any Open Census users in the audience? Couple folks. Finally, Open Tracing. Any Open Tracing users out there? Okay. Two, three. Okay. okay. All right. Excellent. Well, so uh, good news. Some of this stuff will be review for those of you who are familiar with this. So, but for those of you who are brand new, we're happy to cover all of the materials so that you don't wind up lost because exactly. we love to teach people about tracing. So, we've gone ahead and uh, made these slides public. If you go to otel.to forward slash ATO dash workshop, you should be able to get the slides and follow along. And also, if you want to, like, if we don't get to everything, you'll be able to kind of pick up and, and walk through it. We walk through the entire uh, code sample later yeah, on. Yeah, it's super useful because, like, there may be places where we ask you to cut paste code out of the slides, and you really don't want to be retyping that off of what we're presenting to you. So yes. uh, please go ahead and take a moment. Uh, Jenny or, or Vincent, would you mind, uh, our lovely TAs, would you mind uh, typing the URL into the chat? That way people can have it in case they lose it. Yeah. Also, just while we're on this topic, a real quick question uh, is who, if you're familiar with Go, raise your hand because our, our sample code is in Go. We have other options, but... Eh. All right, if you have another language you'd like to use, feel free to uh, paste it into the uh, paste it into the chat into the chat. Yeah. Um, and we can try to get used to settled with that. But Go is going to be our primary instructional language for today. Yeah. So let's go ahead and uh, get into this a little more. So again, I'm Austin Parker. I'm a principal developer advocate at Lightstep. And I'm Liz Fong Jones. I'm a principal developer advocate at Honeycomb. So and we every other are. Tuesday. So interestingly enough, uh, I just want to highlight Austin and I work with companies that compete with each other, uh, but yes. we're all friends because we want you to use open tooling that you can use to write to any tool. Uh, so this is kind of in the spirit of all things open. Yeah, 
Also, every other Tuesday, you can catch Liz and I on uh, twitch.tv forward slash OpenTelemetry for OpenTelemetry Tuesdays, where we talk about the project. It's very fun. You should follow us. So, let's get into the basics of observability. Why do we need observability? Um, I think there, there's obviously discussions about this, right? Like, this is a, I don't want to say moving target, but what we're, I think, what we, to distill it, what we see is, if you think about how do I know if my things are working, right? How do I know my software is working? You know, as the complexity of our systems increase, then the necessity to have a different mental model and a different way of thinking about, you know, what is what does it mean for software to work has actually kind of emerged. When you have a lot of different services, they're going to interact with each other in ways that maybe you didn't expect. Uh, even if you have very and this is where Austin's, uh, Austin and Z folks over at LifeTap have coined this term called deep systems, right? Where yeah. you no longer know what's above and below you because it's just too many layers deep. Yeah, a buddy of mine named Fred has a really good blog post about this, which just talks about, like, if you think about it as a house, you can look in through the windows of a house and you can see only kind of a sliver of what's going on. And if you think about a, you know, a microservice-based system is this big, very complicated house with a lot of different wings, you know, if you're on the outside, you can only really see what is going on through these little windows. And those little windows might not give you a picture of what's actually happening inside. So the sort of problem this gives you is, you know, failures don't necessarily repeat. A Something that failed one way one day might fail in a different way the next day. It's, you know, you don't have this sort of cyclical nature of just being able to, like, figure out how it broke and then keep pushing that button to break it again. When you have multi-tenant systems or you have, th you know, uh, things with a lot of different layers of abstraction, right? I have, Kuber you know, Kubernetes and various cloud resources and API, third-party APIs and all this sort of stuff that it's painful to debug the interactions between those. We need something more than just plain old, you know, dashboards with time series data and, uh, you know, log search. Yeah. In particular, those things tend to be hard to answer with traditional tools, right? Like traditional monitoring tools will tell you whether the thing broke in the exact same way it broke, you know, a month ago, two months ago, three months ago. But ideally, we as engineers are solving new problems, right, rather than we living Groundhog Day over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So often there's kind of this problem. So the problem that we try to solve with observability is being able to find commonalities in our systems, right? To try to figure out what's going on inside of our systems. Why are they doing that? How do I make it stop? How do I, how do I change the bad behavior? Or how do I get more of the good behavior? So it's really important to distinguish observability, right? Like this practice of being able to solve questions iteratively from the instrumentation data itself. So Instrumentation is a thing that you insert into your code in order to produce data, but data in and of itself isn't much use unless you can actually answer your questions with it. Yep. So what we're going to talk about, and really what OpenTelemetry provides, is that data source for you. The telemetry data isn't the observability. The observ you know, observability is about really about process and practice as the cultural change, almost in the, in the same way that like DevOps is, right? It's it's less. You can't buy DevOps and you can't necessarily buy observability. You need to make the changes in your organization to allow for observability to take place. But to get there, you have to have this instrumentation code. And that instrumentation code is going to be things that produce metrics, logs, traces, other signals about what's going on in your software. These are really all different views into the same thing that's going under you know, it says here into the same underlying truth. And in a lot of ways, these are all convertible. I can take traces and I can turn them into time series metric data. I can take logs and turn them into um, metrics. I can take metrics and I can kind of go back into traces. Eh, maybe not go back to traces, but you can certainly take metrics and turn them into logs, right? But what are these things? You know, we, we talk about metrics, logs, and traces, and boy, really, what are they? Yeah, and fortunately, people have coined this uh, unfortunately, unfortunate nomenclature called calling them the pillars of observability. They're not, right? Like, they're just different data formats, uh, yeah. and you don't have to have all three of them. But in case you do run into kind of any one of these three things, uh, this is kind of how you delineate which kind of data is which kind of data. Mm. So metrics are kind of aggregated sum of your statistics, like a count or a histogram or a... Uh, Right, like anything that's like a num a number, right? So, for instance, how many times was the web service hit, or what was the median latency of this service, or 
even potentially like a shape, like, you know, saying, hey, this is the buckets in which all of these uh, different, different, uh, different latencies fall. Yeah. And there's a lot of different types of metrics too. Um, Open Telemetry actually has an interesting take on this that we won't get into uh, due to time today, but Open Telemetry is kind of a, a new idea, maybe a new way of doing a lot of the, the metrics that maybe you're familiar with. If you're coming from like the Prometheus or like the Dog Stats D world or the Stats D world, sorry, I should say, you know, you, you might think about metrics in a certain way. Open Telemetry might not necessarily correspond with that. And over the next like couple months, expect to see a lot of really interesting written content about what is different and why it's different. So just kind of put that in the back of your mind and we'll get back to, you know, find us on Twitter if you want to talk about it later. So the second kind, second big thing here are logs, right? And also traces. And we'll kind of actually combine these when I talk about them because a log is, it's a log statement, right? It's anything from console.println, uh, you know, console.log, hello world is a log, but also some big fancy structured, you know, JSON blob that you're writing out to a file is also a log. Now, Traces are basically those structured logs, except they have context. They have the context of a request. And because they have that request context, because they know like what requests am I part of and what came before me, we can use them to gain insight into the entire life cycle of a request as it moves through our system. So this lets us pinpoint failures, it lets us pinpoint performance issues, and it also lets us derive a lot of really interesting statistical and metric data out of those um, structured log statements that we're creating as traces. Yeah, for instance, you could look at a structured event that has a number of fields and say, show me a metric derived from how many of those things there are that have this particular set of tags, right? So that's kind of how you transmute them between each other. Yeah. And kind of a primitive version of structured of, of logging that people tend to adopt that leads them into tracing is if you put a request ID in every single log, right? Then that inherently becomes this grouping that allows you to find all the log lines associated with one request. So tracing is just taking that one step further and saying, not only do you have a request ID, but you also know who called you before, right? Yeah. So not just here's everything that's happened, but kind of here's a tree or a sequential order. So we'll get into more details of how you might visualize that later in this workshop. Yeah. So, I don't want to dwell too much on the metrics concepts because again, we're not going to cover. Yeah. We only have 90 minutes. We got to move fast. Minutes. Yeah. But there are, you can really think of metrics in one or two ways. They're, they're counts or they're gauges is a, the simplest way to think about it. And a count is a number that goes up. A gauge is, you know, like a fuel gauge or a speedometer. So let's move past that and talk about tracing concepts. So there's three main thing is to understand about a trace. A trace is comprised of spans and a span is a single unit of work. So this is how long for this one service that it take to handle this request, um, this API call, this database lookup, so on and so forth. A trace is a collection of those spans. Uh, you can represent a trace as a directed acyclic graph. So, you know, there's no loops. A trace never loops back on itself. The edges of these uh, graph nodes, these spans, form parent and child relationships between work being done as part of the trace. There's also a concept of you know asynchronous work, right? So I can have a multiple children with the same parent, or I can have multiple operations that aren't necessarily dependent on each other. And tracing systems will display these different ways to indicate the type of work being performed. Finally, there's context, and context is really the key to understanding how traces work, because there's one type of context, the word gets overloaded a lot, uh, but in general, when we're talking about context, we're talking about things like a identifier for a trace, identifier for a span, a indicator for like what the parent span was, and then optionally, you can have something called baggage as part of that context, which are key value pairs that can come from other parts of your system. There so also is kind of this notion of thinking yeah. about like, how do your spans relate to your existing logs, right? Because a span we've described, like describes a unit of work, which means that it has a start time and an end time or a start time and a duration. What about those point in time things, right? Like where you have a log event that just says, hey, this happened. So the answer is that a span event is kind of like a uh, you know point in time log event log 
injury that you can attach to the unit of work in which it happened. And that way you can kind of index those things together without necessarily paying the full overhead of an entire span. If you're coming from the open tracing world, because I remember several people raised their hand at the beginning, a event in open telemetry is analogous to an open tracing log. Sorry, every time I click over, I have to reset my pointer. So how do I implement all this? Well, you need a way to instrument your software. You need a place to send the data. You need a place to visualize that data. It's not worth a ton just instrumenting your code and then not having any way to kind of look at what you've done, right? And this is where open telemetry comes in. So we'll start out with a brief history of how we got here. Open Tracing was a project that 2016-ish uh, Genesis, maybe, let's say, and although it had been worked on before, and it really bears a lot of debt to a project at Google called Dapper that they've been using since early 2000s, mid 2000s, one of the first large scale production deployments of distributed tracing that's recorded at least. So the idea with open tracing was, hey, we tracing is very useful, but if you went and tried to do tracing in 2016, 2015, you would have to pick a vendor. You'd have to say like, well, I, I wanna use this one proprietary thing, or maybe I wanna use this other open source thing but I'm very tied into that one specific platform. I can't easily migrate my tracing code. And that made it difficult, not only for you as like an end user to say, well, what about, you know, maybe I wanna try this other thing out. You'd have to go through and do a lot of work to re-implement tracing. The other problem was it meant that someone else, you know, a, a open source library author couldn't necessarily say, well, I wanna add tracing support to my library that I'm going to give to other people because there wasn't a good open source you know, API to code those traces against. So that's the world open tracing came from. Open Census was another Google project that they open sourced in 2017-ish. Uh, open Census was not only that API, but it was also an implementation. It was a reference SDK, it was like, okay, here's the open source API, but here's also how we're gonna implement this. And the API and the SDK were very tightly coupled, so which was fine, but there kind of was a big, you know, people, I won't say people butting heads, it was all very polite and nice, but there were these two visions of how to do this. And it seemed strange to a lot of people, including the maintainers that, hey, there's, why do we have these things? Why are they competing? So long story short, we brought all this stuff together and formed open telemetry as a merger of the open tracing and open census projects and we've been working on it for about two years now yep and we're very close to sunsetting open tracing and open census which i am super excited about um so this is a collaboration between end users and vendors and open source projects uh so you'll see folks from for instance uber working on this google uh as well as like step and honeycomb and so forth yep. And also open telemetry expand, kind of broadened the base a little bit. So instead of just an API and SDK, open telemetry also includes a lot of tools, uh, a lot of things to kind of ease your journey of observability instrumentation. Things like the open telemetry collector, which we'll talk a little about later, but also things like automatic instrumentation agents for languages and platforms that have them, such as Java, uh, Python. So it's a whole collection of things and a standard wire format so that, you know, everyone can kind of speak the same language when it comes to trace data and metric data. So we'll start with the API. And this is the part that if you are instrumenting software, uh, it's the part you're going to become familiar with. There's two basic primitives. There's a tracer and a meter. A tracer is responsible for managing access to a span, managing span creation lifecycle, and a meter is what accumulates statistics. So it's uh, you create a metric instrument off of a meter, or you could use a, uh, you get a metric instrument and record, you know, counts or gauges or whatever against that. You could have unique ones of these within the same process. So I could have like multiple tracers in one process, and this is done to help namespace the telemetry data that you're creating. So, so the deal with uh, providers is that because you can have more than one, uh, you kind of have to tell the SDK which one is my default. 
So in this case, uh, the standard boilerplate that most people wind up inserting at the top of every single one of their open telemetry programs is to say, here's my tracer provider. Uh, let's instantiate it with some potential parameters saying, you know, where am I outputting to and so forth. And then you go ahead and instantiate it. Um, and then you, anytime you need a tracer, you can say, hey, I need a tracer for the workshop main class, or hey, I need a, tr a tracer for this, for this uh, library. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, this code example is in Go, but the same pattern is present in every open telemetry library, the theory regardless of language, so that you can be comfortable in any kind of uh, any languages open telemetry code base. Yeah, a high level, I will say there's one notable exception to this, and this is .NET. .NET open telemetry integrates very deeply with uh, Microsoft's system.diagnostics uh, library. And if you are a .NET user interested in this, then find me on twitter and we'll talk about it yeah. but uh there are also uh light step actually developed this really cool thing called the uh open telemetry launcher which basically yeah. simplifies a lot of that boilerplate and automatically sets it up for you so ask yeah. austin about it later you can also ask some of these uh you don't have to you don't have to ask me about everything um there's a lot of things i'm a bad source on so when you have a tracer and you want to start a span you call span you call start on the tracer and uh, you pass in a go context the name of the span, and then a bunch of oh, there's a bunch of options you can pass in, like setting the start or stop time. One thing I will point out: the name is very important. So if you think about the name of a span, is effectively the primary way you group spans together um, in an analysis system, and you want to be careful about what you name things. You want to avoid. You basically want to make sure that you name things in a way that groups lodge things that should be together together. So for instance, if I have an API that has uh, maybe get and post available, a good practice might be to not have the name be get HTTP dot da 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 and post HTTP da 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 da. It might be to have the name of the span just be the API route. So for a forward slash API slash V1 slash foo, and then use what, we're, what are called attributes, which we'll talk about in a moment, but are metadata to use an attribute of HTTP.method to specify get or post. And this way you can do interesting queries. You can say like, okay, show me the ratio of gets versus posts in a way that if you had named the span with that important you know, data attached to it, it'd be more difficult to do that kind of interesting group by query. Yeah, because essentially you want to be able to find all similar queries that share that same route, for instance, or same that share the same route and service. So kind yeah. of, if you think about your schema early on, it will really, really help you. But on the other hand, you can also change it if it's not working for you. This is kind of part of the magic is that your telemetry is not a fixed thing that someone has set up for you, right? Instead, you get to decide, and if it's not working for you, you get to change it. Yeah. So the other operation that you need in addition to starting a uh, trace span is sometimes someone has already started a trace span for you. So for instance, a lot of open telemetry's automatic instrumentation will create the uh, the info and populate it into your Go context object. So span from context is a way of just saying, hey, Tracer, where am I right now? So that you can work with that span object. There are three other things that are really important. One is add events. So we talked about events before. This lets you add structured annotations or logs about what's currently happening. A good example of when you might use this uh, and an interesting property of events in the context of spans <clears throat> is when you create an event on a span, uh, it records the timestamp as a, a diff or it records a timestamp, but that timestamp is displayed as a time is the time elapsed from the start of the span. So let's say you have some section of code where you're trying to get a lock. You can create an event at the start of when you're trying to get that lock, and then you can create another event, you know, after you've acquired it. And then in your trace analyzer, you'd be able to see these two events and say, you know, five nanoseconds or whatever after it started, trying to get the lock, cool. 300 milliseconds, got the lock. So you can very easily say, oh, I spent a ton of time waiting to acquire the, the mutex. Yep. The other thing that's super handy that we talked about just a moment ago is the idea of an attribute. So an attribute is a key value pair, right? It's like a super wide dictionary that you can append. So if you've ever seen a structured event, uh, it's very, very similar, right? It's just putting key value pairs and attaching it to your current span. 
So the difference from a structured log is that you might kind of assemble or emit many different ones of is that we collect up all of the attributes that are set and wait until the and wait until the event is done and then we send the entire span all at once with all of the key value pairs. So that's what end is for. End kind of stops the timer, says this is the total duration, and attaches all of the uh, attributes that you sent and passes them off so you can analyze them. So starting and ending is fairly straightforward. Um, in Go, especially, it's very idiomatic to, at kind of the start of your function, to ask for a tracer, get the uh, tracer back, create a span from that tracer. So in this case, it's going to be named persists, and then immediately defer that span. When uh, this function goes out of scope um, or is returns, then that span will end and be sent off to be processed. Getting the current span, again, if you have a span because it's in the, the context is being injected from automatic instrumentation or for whatever reason, maybe you uh, are instrumenting multiple functions on a program and you've added a span to you know, your Go context object and then pass the context object to a new function. Trace that span from context. Spans have, uh, there's a lot that we kind of are alighting here about spans as structured logs. And you can read all this if you'd like. And I would actually, if this is interesting, I would encourage you to kind of go look at the open telemetry specification on GitHub and read up on this stuff. But spans It's surprisingly have readable. Like it's written in yeah. Markdown. It's written like by engineers for engineers, but not, you know, by standards committees. Yeah, it, it's... It's very readable and it also helps you understand, I think, a lot of the thinking that goes into this and like what is actually happening and why it's happening. But spans have uh, status codes and they have a lot of semantic information available to sort of indicate as a hint to some analysis system like what actually happened. So one of these is the idea of span status. Now, I believe there's some flux still on span status and what codes are acceptable, but you can sort of map these to GRPC like codes, essentially. Or GRPC codes, yeah. Uh, yes. Adding an event is span dot add event, and then setting attributes span dot set attributes. In general, these are going to be pretty consistent across multiple languages. So it, the exact details might be different from Go, but if you are in JavaScript, uh, you should expect to see very similar things if you're in Python or Java. A fairly similar API. There's now, I will point out, if, especially if you came from the open telemetry world, or I'm sorry, open tracing world, where all the APIs were extremely similar, it's less like that in open telemetry. Each individual language has a lot more freedom to kind of adjust. They to have follow to the, the conventions of that language. Yeah, they, you can be a bit more conventional. Uh, we made the decision that basically people are going to be more productive in the language that they, if if this feels like it's another thing that they're used to rather than like, it all feels like Java. So do you want to tackle context propagation? Sure, I can talk about context propagation really quickly. Um, so context propagation, sometimes known as baggage, is this idea that we need to be able to pass along kind of key value pairs from process to process uh, about the execution of the request. The one mandatory key value pair is you have to have a trace ID, you have to have your parent span ID, Everything else is kind of fungible, but the core idea is you want tracing to not just be single process tracing, but distributed tracing, right? This is the difference between traditional APM and distributed tracing is that it's distributed. And it used to be that every vendor had its own standard, um, that open or that open tracing had a standard, Zipkin had a standard, and so on and so forth. But now there is a W3C standard, and uh, open telemetry is one of the reference implementations of that standard. Yeah. Although I will point out uh, Open Telemetry supports not only that W3C standard, but also supports the more traditional B3 standard, which was uh, yep. popular. And it's pluggable. Um, so, actually, one of the fun exercises we've been doing at Honeycomb has been making our previous proprietary exporter have this notion of being able to pick up the W3C trace standard or to create the, and send the W3C trace headers. So, you know, yeah. there are migration paths for all of these things, which is great. Um, because you don't want to be sending both sets of headers all the time. Yeah. And right now, like as of 
October 2020, B3 is more widely supported by a variety of tooling, um, notably things like Envoy uh, only talk B3. They don't talk W3C yet. But in 2021 and beyond, I would expect that we'll see a migration towards uh, W3C everywhere. So I mentioned at the jump, but you have automatic instrumentation. And this is one of the real benefits, uh, I think, of open telemetry and of getting sort of this cons broad consensus across the different monitoring, tracing, APM vendors, whatever, because you have a huge variety of this and it makes your life so much simpler. This example here is uh, instrumenting the mm, open telemetry uh, using the net HTTP instrumentation in Go. And this is really saying, hey, here's a HTTP server. And whenever I get a request in, I'm wrapping my handler function in the Otel HTTP instrumentation library. And whenever a new request comes in, it'll create a span. And if there was a incoming, if it was traced you know, on the way in too, and so it sees, hey, I see a headers from a prior service that had tracing enabled, then it's going to make this new one a child of that incoming request, which is very handy. Yeah, and in particular, this is not necessarily true for Go, but it's true for a lot of other languages. Uh, shout out to Datadog for donating their integrations. Like we wouldn't have been able to get so many different integrations so quickly if Datadog hadn't donated all of their instrumentation code. Yeah, and also uh, I believe New Relic has also played, has also donating their instrumentation and has open sourced all their stuff. Yeah, so it's pretty great. Yeah, there's a. It's going to be really exciting uh, over the like. It's been two years of fun. But now it's going to be another year of real fun as uh, everyone kind of standardizes around this stuff. Yep. So the rest of the rest of the picture, rest of the portrait. Eh. Got to work on my analogies here. So the SDK is actually underpins the API. The SDK is what does all the stuff we just talked about. As I mentioned at the jump, the API and the SDK are decoupled. So you can actually selectively re-implement re a lot of what OpenTelemetry does under the hood if you like. And it's been designed with this in mind. So if you don't like the particular way that, you know, the trace export pipeline works, you could rewrite that if you wanted. Now, what's more interesting is because it's decoupled, it's also very extensible. And you're able to write a lot of different sort of extensions to this, and you're able to do a lot of custom stuff if you want to. We'll talk about that more in the context of the collector, but you can do everything from writing your own, you know, you know about the schema of your you know traces, so you're going to write PII filters that you just kind of throw out everywhere in your own code base, or you're going to do like geo lookups of IPs, you know, whatever it is, you can write a plugin for it in open telemetry. The other important thing is this idea of an exporter. Once you've created the telemetry it has to go somewhere. And I'm happy to say there's extremely broad support for open telemetry through these exporters, both native What's really ingest. cool especially is that like the open telemetry collector is like a Swiss army knife. It takes literally any trace or metrics format and outputs literally any trace or metrics format. Like you name it, you can find it in ingest or, or egress for it. It's pretty great. And for a lot of languages, you can also find sort of that native integration, like the exporter for the language itself. Like I know in Go, Honeycomb has a Go exporter. Um, I believe there's there's a bunch of others. Yep, but in a lot of cases, you don't even need a vendor-specific exporter because people have been doing work to ingest uh, OpenTelemetry's native wire format. Uh, yeah. So basically, OpenTelemetry can be adapted to your needs. Uh, so there's a lot of configuration knobs, but we try at least to make it do the sensible thing out of the box. Yeah. So there's three vendor-neutral exporters that come out of the box, uh, sometimes four. There's a Jaeger exporter. Sometimes there's also a Zipkin exporter. Uh, Prometheus ex support exists for outputting metric data, and then there's standard out and standard error. So you can just actually writing just write writing texts. You can examine the JSON. It's you know pretty handy when you're trying to figure out what's going on. And then yeah. I guess the fifth one is the kind of native uh, OTLP format. So the yeah, proto buffs that open telemetry wrote itself. Yeah, incidentally, OTLP is o open telemetry open O T, and the L is the L in telemetry. And P is protocol. I've gotten questions on that before. I was also really confused about it. <clears throat> so the collector actually has a lot of features other than just proxying your traces and metrics and exporting them. Um, 
like Liz said, it's a Swiss Army knife. You can receive anything, you can output anything. And as long as you're using the same trace context propagation, so if you're using B3 everywhere, then it doesn't really even really matter how those traces were emitted. So I can have Zipkin traces coming in, I can have OTLP traces coming in, and as long as they have the same IDs, because they were using the same context propagation format, then it can output them in some other format entirely to wherever I want. You can also add custom processors. So you can do things like sampling or filtering or do a lot of transforms in your trace data or your metrics. You can filter things out. You can add things in like resources. You can run the collector as either an agent um, alongside your code or as a sidecar, or you can run it as a standalone mode. You can have a pool of these things collecting telemetry from a bunch of different services and then shipping it off somewhere else. And it gives you a nice separation of concerns between the people writing the code and the people having to get the telemetry out to places. And it runs on Windows, too. Yep. Cool. Uh, let's try to get you at least through the uh, setup instructions uh, yeah. so for the interactive part before the break. And then after the break, then we will be available to help you work through the kind of uh, hands-on material. Yeah. So our interactive work today. So if you go to, can someone post this link in the chat? Because what we're going to do I is... you. Uh, we're going to use a, program, a software called Glitch, which is a web-based uh, IDE plus code execution thing plus a lot of other stuff. It's really cool. Check them out. So you'll go to this project, this Open Telemetry Student project, and you will click Remix. And this will give you your own container and your own copy of the code running. You might have to create an account, so we'll give people time to do that. Should I pop out of the slides and... Let me pop out of the slides real quick to show folks. And if you are having any trouble with this, feel free to uh, use the chat functionality here. Um, and we will uh, help you out as much as we can uh, with debugging the issue. Yeah. All right, I posted a link in the chat. So once you're in there, you should see this remix to edit in the upper right. Go too big. That's good. So you'll click a remix to edit. Say got it. And then it'll take a few. So while Austin is doing that, I'm going to describe what the example app does. Um, Austin, want to pull up the source uh, main.go folder? So this app is simulating a microservice, except for it's only one service, but it's one service that recursively calls itself. There's a function to calculate the Fibonacci sequence. Um, so the Fibonacci sequence is taken by taking the two previous values and adding them together. So 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so forth, where 13 was made by 5 plus 8. So you can see how we might be able to construct a fancy distributed call graph that way. We'll only have to instrument one place. Um, there is a fib handler that takes care of doing the computation, and there is a um, and th and there is a main handler that will just print hello world. Um, so this is the app in which we're going to be working for the rest of this afternoon, and we're going to be instrumenting it so that you can visualize what's it doing, uh, where does it spend the time, especially when you ask it to compute the sixth, seventh, eighth, or ninth Fibonacci number, where it gets really, really slow. So if you want to understand why is it slow and visualize it, uh, then stick around. Yeah. Should we go back to the slides? Yeah, so I just want to... You'll know yeah. you're good when you... So you'll, you'll know you're good when you can go into the tools down here and the logs. Uh, you'll see this initializing the server line. And then you'll be 
you'll be solid. Uh, there's also uh, the team. There's a team in Glitch. I that couldn't you... figure out how to join the team. It was weird. I. Uh, well, then don't worry about it then. Uh, yeah, what you'll be able to do, if you have a problem, you can just drop a link to your project in the chat. And Yep, if you drop a link help. to your project in the chat, uh, Austin, Jenny, or I will request to edit your project, and then you can approve it, and then we'll be able to see the same logs and code side by side with you, which is kind of part of the advantage of why you do Glitch for Virtual Workshop. Yeah. So... Uh, again, not a ton going on here. You know, Liz explained most of this, really. You have a root handler that prints Hello World. You have a Fibonacci handler that will check the Fibonacci sequence. And you have Quick Quick Quit, which will oh, We killed the Quick Quick Quit. It now automatically oh, it reloads. You used to have to oh. manually reload it, but uh, Glitch now, anytime you edit the Go file, it will automatically recompile. Oh, nice. All right, so ignore that. So uh, uh, why yeah. don't we go ahead and take a 15-minute break, and we will see you at uh, roughly uh, 4.55, 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern, or one forty or 1.55, 2 p.m. Pacific. Yep. And if you are having trouble getting towards having the thing cloned, we can help you during the break period. We'll just be around with our video off. Uh, so just paste a link if you're having trouble, and we'll help you out. Yeah. So we'll see you all back here in 15. And yeah, if you want swag, uh, Jenny will paste a link to get some honeycomb swag. And I'm sure Austin has a swag link as well. Yes, actually, if you would like a free copy of a book, Distributed Tracing and Practice, please follow the link I just posted. Right, and I've seen their swag. They are so cool. I love to get them for myself. So you better get the swag now and see you in... The 17 minutes. Yes, go get the honeycomb swag now, and you're gonna agree with me. Hello, folks. Welcome back to part two of the Open Telemetry Workshop. Uh, if you are joining us again, uh, we'll get the slide link posted. Yeah. Du -du 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 slides. And so for reference, uh, the first 45 minutes was a lecture. Um, the next 45 minutes are time for you to get your hands dirty with open telemetry uh, to actually go work with the code and instrument a sample application that we've put together for you. So let's jump back in. Get my chat open, sorry. There we go. All right, so we want to instrument our service. So how do we do that? First, we need to add some imports and set up our tracer provider. So let's, let's see, what's the best way to do this? We'll just kind of get both of these in here. So that people understand why we're doing this uh, in case they missed the first part of the session. Uh, so as a reminder, the reason why we're doing this is because you need OpenTelemetry's SDK initialized in order to be able to collect telemetry data, which you're using in order to improve your observability. So what Austin is doing is importing the uh, global API and the trace API, uh, or the, the SDK trace and uh, import so that we can uh, go ahead and instantiate them. Yep. And you can feel free to follow along with us. If you run a little slower, that's fine. If you run a little faster, also fine. Like, uh, feel free to speak up in chat and Austin or I, whomever's not actively typing, uh, will, help, will help you out. So again, we're adding in our imports. We're <clears throat> uh, you should pop up in the tools pane so people can see what it looks like when it's recompiling. Yeah. Does this not take uh, common out API trace for now because we're not using it yet? Oh right, right. right. And then new tracer error? provider does not return error anymore. Ah. Uh, 
that caught me off by surprise. So we should uh, edit that in the slides. Yep, missed that one. I thought I got everything. I did not. All right. And there you go. It says initializing. So that means that we got it compiling. So you should not expect to see anything yet, right? Like this is just setting up all of the initialization and scaffolding. Yeah. As a quick point of clarification, this uh, with config default sampler always sample. This just makes sure that this samples or ops in, or collects a hundred or generates, I should say, a hundred percent of the traces and spans that your service generates. Sampling is a technique to reduce the amount of uh, telemetry generated for a variety of reasons. So. Our next step is going to be to add tracing spans to the logic. We need to wrap our handlers in. <clears throat> well, we have two, right? We have the two routes. We have the root span or the root route or the index route, and then we have our Fibonacci route. So we want to wrap these in our automatic instrumentation that's provided by the Open Telemetry Project. Um, we also want to be able to look at stuff for these internal functions right so we have this mock function this db handler that represents like oh something's happening i'm calling a database i have some blocking behavior so we want to add an internal span to view that and then we also want to add in parameters on our or, or metadata i guess i should say about our fibonacci spans right so we want to say like not only have a span for the handler being invoked but we also want to see like you know what what's you know what's the value of in or at each uh, iteration and we want to have spans for all those parallel client calls and we want to propagate all that context downstream which is back into itself in this case so first let's add our root handler so we can get and see something So we need to So once again, this is using the, op the uh, automatic instrumentation that we described earlier. So the way that this works is that it implements the HTTP handler interface and it just calls uh, start span. It reads the information out of the trace headers and so forth, and then it calls, it hooks into your existing handler. So that's kind of part of the cool magic, uh, or I would say it's not really that magic to have wrappers in Go, but in other languages where there is the possibility to hook at the bytecode or kind of override level, so Python, Java, uh, you literally, you don't even have to do this. Uh, it'll just automatically hook into your web framework. Yep. There we go. Make sure you have your parentheses correct. So let's also get our internal spans going here and propagate context inside the function. So we have our. So this is not for the fib function. This is for the root function and the database fake database handler that we call. Yep. So we've got our CTX and root handler. We have DB handler. We need to. Oh, we are already passing in. The context is so great. So let's go down to DB handler. We need to get our tracer. So we can do tracer provider, tracer DB handler. And we can just kind of copy and paste this right over. And then grab the rest of it. So as we mentioned before, we call, we have a global provider, or we have a global provider registered. That was part of that boilerplate we did at the beginning. So we can call the global func uh, methods in OpenTelemetry to say, hey, give us that tracer provider we registered earlier, and then we can grab a tracer out of it named DB Handler, and then we simply start a span off of that and tell it to end when this finishes. And 
and now we need to actually get all this stuff going somewhere. Because otherwise, it's just instrumenting it, and then it's saying, I don't know what to do with this. I'm not going to send it anywhere. But we want to be able to visualize what's going on, and the simplest visualization is just a little bit of JSON. So that's what we're going to wire up next. Yep. So we can uh, just get a standard out exporter, and then we're going to add it to our trace provider, a sinker. Uh, did that import path change? Uh, when in doubt, cons consult the instructor copy. Uh, the other thing that's really nice about Golang is that there is developer documentation. Uh, if you go to go.opentelemetry.io, uh, it'll pull up the uh, developer documentation, including the API info. Ah, it's just uh, exporter exporters yeah. STD out because they're, it's not specific to tracing or metrics. We just combine them into one exporter, so it breaks uh. the. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. It's fine. Sorry. No, I mean, it makes sense. Um, all right. 32, no new. 44. So you'll probably get an error about shadowing the error variable. 32. Oh, and then you need to make sure you have your commas. And then standard out that options. What was it? Go open to one three to IO. Config now. Is am I, I going to go over here and find that it's been configed, or is it just simplified? Has been simplified. All right. So once you've done all of that, you have your standard out exporter. Update this. While now we want to actually view it. So let's go ahead and um, if you look at the show button, it'll let you preview the app uh, next to the code or in a new window. So you'll see, hi, this is a demo app. And now you should indeed see uh, a JSON representation of some tracing data. And so there's several interesting things in in all of this. Uh, one, you'll notice a bunch of these attributes. These are standard attributes that are being added in by that net HTTP instrumentation. And a lot of these are semantic following semantic conventions. So, you know, across open telemetry, you could have a different dozen different web servers running in a dozen dozen languages, and as long as they follow the open telemetry standard conventions. You know, you'll see these same the same metadata. You'll see net.transport. You'll see net.hostname, HTTP method, HTTP target. This stuff is all standardized, and it's one of the real advantages to using OpenTelemetry, in the so that you can kind of compare things across different languages or platforms, and it's going to have the same stuff there, making your queries very, you know, robust. And 
yeah, there's a lot going on in these. So if you're following along and you don't see this, can you drop us a line? Yep, drop us a link in the chat um, to your glitch.com slash edit link, and then that'll enable Austin or me or Jenny to reach uh, to request access to your app to look at the logs so we can code it alongside you. In the meanwhile, uh, we do only have 45 minutes. We're yeah, 15 so. minutes in. Let's just keep on plowing through. Um, yeah. So again, message events, attributes, they're all in that JSON. But let's, let's go ahead and get into the. Yeah, let's do the more the, interesting the, distributed tracing bit, because I think yeah. that's what people came here for. Yep. So we need to grab this key package. We want to, similar to what we did earlier, call that fib, and then in fib handler, And we want to actually put these in different places. We're going to put the result down here after we've calculated the result. Now we'll need information about the client. So there might be some duplicates, imports, yeah. So this is getting the actual outbound request uh, instrumented as well. This net HTTP, hotel HTTP. Just yep, this is true in most languages that your HTTP server framework is not necessarily the same as your outbound HTTP call uh, calls. Yeah. It's helpful in a lot of cases to instrument both the client and the server so you can see you know, how much latency is introduced by the network and how much is inside of the, uh, inside, inside of the handlers. Uh, the other circumstance that we find it to be very common is where you don't control the server on the other end, where you definitely want that HTTP call instrumentation uh, because you're not getting those spans from the downstream server. Uh, yeah. But if you have to drop one, drop the client call because uh, you know it, every single uh, server span needs a you know it's going to need a server span. Yeah. So inside of our client call here, we're, we're starting a new context and then uh, creating a span inside that called fib client. <clears throat> Just copying off the instructor one because less clicking back and forth. So we're going to add some attributes in an event here. Um, our attribute is the URL, and then the event is going to be the loop count. So we need to make sure we do that after the URL. And then we have a couple more things we've got. So before, just to point out, we had this new HTTP new request, and we actually want to get rid of that. We want to do this new request with context. Um, then what we're saying is use W3C trace propagation, and we're calling inject, which actually adds the uh, span context into the headers so that they will come back around and get picked up. And then we call client.do which is our HTTP client. And now if you go and do you preview this, is it I equal four, let's say. Oh, I messed up another import. Oh, it's label, not key. And... Wow. I did not 
to do great on this that I on updating the slides. Yep, joys of a beta project. Um, we are in the process of finalizing things for release, but that means that there have been a couple of breaking uh, changes that we had to make both in the spec level as well as in each individual language sig. Yeah. It's getting better, we promise. And uh, yeah, and a lot of the boilerplate stuff here is significantly easier, but with, especially in the Go side of things, using a distribution like the Hotel Launcher. What am I missing here? Just, where is key set? 78. Oh. That attributes label that end. And I need my tracer. Do you want to just work on fixing the uh, glitch up while I fix the uh, slides? Yeah. Great. Division of labor. Also, yes. um, testing in production. You can never fully catch these things. Uh, that's true. In your in your beta testing. So also you can if for those in the audience that want to follow along, I'll just post the link to the instructor one. So the instructor one is the client one without the things in. So you can also look at that. Yeah, we've got two instructor ones, right? Like we've got the one that Austin's working in, and then there is a kind of canonical solution, uh, which I updated this morning. So Yeah. This is the canonical one, right? Yeah. Make sure I'm copying off the right thing. Undefined key. There we go. So once you fixed all the issues, by going to you know fib i equals whatever I put in i equals four because it's pretty quick, you can see a bunch of more spans in your output, but these spans are not, I mean, they're interesting. Like it, this is, if you took this and you unwound it, you would actually see like the entire trace of how it calculated this and where it, you know, was hitting zero. And you should actually see quite a few uh, because recursive functions will generate quite a few spans like this. But if we want to get this out slightly more usefully uh, rather than just JSON and a log, we want to put it into some sort of trace analyzer. So for that purpose, we have a tool called Jaeger. Like we set that up in GCP. So if you go to slide 44, there's a thing here. So you can copy and paste this Jaeger endpoint into your .env file. And then we will grab our Jaeger export config, put that up here near the standard out one. Make sure we import the Jaeger exporter. And the final step is to add the Jaeger exporter to our trace provider. One thing to keep in mind, you can have multiple um, exporters on one provider. So you can export from a single process to you know, console, to Jaeger, to Honeycomb, to whatever else. 
this is part of why open telemetry is cool, right? It's and this is actually one of the advantages over open tracing. Open tracing only lets you supply one single per, uh, exporter, right? It only lets you provide one single SDK implementation, whereas open telemetry lets you chain arbitrarily many together. So you can dual write, which means that you can kind of compare, and we encourage you to compare some shop to see what you like better. Yeah. Also remember to uncomment the service name uh, line at the top of this. All right. Once you've done all that, then nothing will have changed here. However, if you go to Jaeger, I'll put this link in chat. So if you'll go to this Jaeger instance we've got running, and you'll be able to to. Look for your service. So there we go. Chocolate funky make make. Ta da! Really good name. It really is. It's pretty hilarious. So. Oh, Austin, uh, you're missing the step we ran into this morning. The uh, configuring the propagators. Each uh, individual oh, yeah, client trace is giving its own. Yeah. Okay. Let me fix that. Yeah. Oh, right, it's a global. I thought I had it. Yeah. Another recent, very recent, actually. This was what? Last release of, I think, about 0.13. Oh, and now I need propagators. I knew there was a reason that I had propagate. I knew there was a reason I had that in there, but. Undefined hotel. Where's hotel coming from? There we go, slide updated. <laughs> All right, I'll go IO hotel. All right. There we go, it's working. There we go. So you'll need to add this uh, set text map propagator. You'll need to add this, you'll need to tell the global tracer, hey, what, or global configuration, hey, these are the propagators that you should use. And once you've done that, You should see something that makes a little more sense. If I go, say, seven, that should definitely get us a bigger trace. Seven, that's bold. Yeah. Mm. I think it's the 437 millisecond one. No? No. Uh, I think something else is... Yeah, we don't have... I think propagation is still not working. Did you cause... set uh, Did you set the propagator uh, right after tracer provider? Yeah, you did. Yeah. Um... Trace context, baggage. Huh. That worked for me. Um, oh, did you? Uh, did we do this correctly? Did we pass correctly down here? Oh. Inject W3C. Yeah, that looks correct. Hmm. Why don't we show them a trace from uh, not from Funky Make Make, but instead from? Uh, let me change the Jaeger endpoint in the yeah. instructor code. Let's see if that works. So the Jaeger endpoint for the instructor code is going to be 3474. Great. We'll change that over here. All 
All right, I have now changed that. Um, so now let's open that. Jib i equals five. Uh, and then we should see not just chocolate funky, but we should also see uh, open telemetry instructor in the list. Yep. yep, there's open telemetry instructor. So we can indeed uh -oh. see 97 spans. Okay, so the code does work. The instructor copy works. We've just introduced some small delta between the instructor copy and the copy Austin's working in. Yeah, which is strange. But to give you an example of what it looks like when it's done correctly, Yep, that is the kind of classic tried and true trace waterfall view. Yeah. Now let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of this. The advantage is for one trace, you can see how that one trace executed. You can even like ask Jaeger to show you, you know, show me a trace from five seconds ago that had a latency of one second to two seconds. But it cannot show you data like how many times did the span happen inside of this trace, right? You might have to manually count. Similarly, it won't give you like data on how many different right, like on properties of querying across more than one trace. Mm -hmm. Like asking, what's the P50 of the net HTTP call uh, only when I equals five? You can't do that in Jaeger. Yeah. So it's a useful starting place, right? It's far more informative than the text JSON, um, but you kind of need to apply a little bit more season tool seasoning, I would say. Yeah, and that's the great thing about OpenTelemetry is that it makes it very easy to kind of use newer tools, use different tools, use you know a variety of options to get at the data you want. So we don't have neighbors. Oh, is it this? Is it because we didn't do with public endpoint? No, that wouldn't be it, would it? Likely not. Yeah. Cool. Why don't uh, we go ahead and keep on moving that, that, yeah. and get people down the direction of sending their data to other tools? Excellent tools like Lightstep. Yes, like Lightstep and Honeycomb. So for Lightstep, if you would like to try sending your data there, Lightstep will accept uh, the OTLP, the native protocol for open telemetry. We'll just ingest that so you can sign up uh, for a free account at this link. What you'll do once you've signed in is, once you signed up, it doesn't take too long, but you'll, you know, when you go to settings and you'll have these access tokens down here. These aren't really like API keys. These are, are routing tokens, but I'm going to copy one and you'll set that in your .env. It's ls key. So the next step, whoop, 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 whoop. so you need to do two things. You'll need to bring in the OTLP exporter, and then you'll need to set up that exporter in here. And you also have to, like we did with the Jaeger thing, you have to add it to the tracer provider chain. Yes. What did I call it? OTLP exporter. Now, one other thing you'll need to do for LightSup to work is you'll need to uh, add some more resources. So you'll need to add these semantic conventions, uh, which are, we're gonna have to, there's two that we're gonna set today, um, the service name and a service version. And we can do that anytime before we configure our tracer provider. And these resources are part of the, again, I was talking about how open preliminary standardizes some things. So, you should get in the habit of setting these uh, service name, service version resources on your services to begin with that you're instrumenting because trace analysis systems can use these to do interesting things. I believe Honeycomb has some features based around like service name if you mark it in the schema, right? Uh, 
Yep, that's so exactly that. correct. So it lets you differentiate, you know, when is it crossing a service boundary, you know, differentiate a span named uh, slash, you know, the route name slash on service A versus service B, so on and so forth. Yeah. So attributes are, uh, are again, resources are effectively special attributes that they, I'm sorry about my cat. She is being very demanding. We all live the work from home life. It's totally understandable. Yeah. But so you'll, for your attributes, there's a whole slew of conventions that you can find. Um, some of them are specified in this conventions package, which. I lost my place. Anyway, like attribute service name, attribute service version. So we're going to use a service name that's specified here. We're going to use a version number of whatever. Oh, we're going to use a version number without smart quotes. And we're going to look at our logs. And we're going to wait for things to download. Yeah, it turns out when you uh, import when you import OTLP, it has to download the protobuf stack, which and the uh, gRPC stack, which we hadn't previously needed to pull in. So yes. the good news is modularism, right? Like we didn't need it until we needed it. On the other hand, like now now this is taking slightly longer. Yeah. Uh, while that. we do that, uh, let's briefly talk about honeycomb. Uh, honeycomb as well. So if you look at the next slide. Um, if you click that link, I also pasted in the chat, um, you can go ahead and set up the Honeycomb exporter. Um, you don't have to do that now. It's yeah. fine. I trust people to figure it out. Um, and then on the next slide, there is information on how to set up the Honeycomb exporter and similarly add it to the chain of uh, exporters that you're using. And I tested it this morning and it works fine. Um, cool. So we can get that pasted in, and then you can kind of have a look at the same data in Jaeger and Honeycomb and LightStep at the same time and see what insights you can get out of it and maybe answer some of those questions that we put earlier in the discussion about yeah. like, you know, hey, can you figure out the number of times X is called when Y is called or so forth. Yep. All right. And then H and Y. Uh, it's it's not honey close. It's honey shut down context dot background. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Oh. Yeah. Camel case like that. Yep. Uh, no, shut down context dot background. Oh oh. Yep. Precisely like that. Uh, might require the context uh, library. I thought. Context was yeah. yeah, context was Oh, it's there. Uh, line 38 is erroring, though. Oh. Uh, 38, unexpected. Oh. Wait. Uh, is it? Oh, I think it's... No? Oh, yep. That would do it. Oh, is it this is now what am I doing mm -hmm. here? It's complaining that you have one too many brace. Uh, you you uh you are failing to close a brace properly somewhere. Uh, yeah. Upstream oh, of wait. that. There's that too. I think I had some line breaks also get interpreted incorrectly. 
uh, multiple value and single value. Actually, I could have sworn that wasn't. J exporter. I think I've. Someone is asking about the Google Docs link. Uh, let me go ahead and pull up the slides link again. Where is that? Ah, uh, otel.2 slash ATO workshop. I'll paste it yes. here. There you go. And I'll yeah. also paste it in here. And someone saying extra comma on the line, end of line 37 question mark. Oh, wait. I don't think that's oh, I think I see the problem. Uh, oh, scroll down. Where? Uh, API key, honey key. Nope, that's oh, correct. That's, that's right. fine. Hmm. Oh, I wonder uh, if I'm also J missing Sporter. the CRPC credential stuff. Yeah, hmm. you're probably missing some imports. These are things that you could you know, figure out what the documentation and compiler, but we're unfortunately constrained to 45 minutes. So yes, I think rather than work through this on stream, um, why don't we give people the opportunity to ask us any questions that they have? Yeah, I would love to hear what kind of questions people have. Any questions at all? Yeah, usually this goes um, significantly more time. Kind of compressed it for the format. Uh, and you can find, where are my office hours at? How's the integration with frameworks and libraries work? Similar to the base language support, uh, like the integration for Kafka. Yeah, generally, like, do you mean Kafka client or server? Because I don't know if there's a server integration. Maybe there's like uh, a- There are some slides that we actually cut from the slide deck, um, but they're in the template for this uh, that cover how to serialize to plain text. And then you can just embed that as part of your Kafka, um, as part of your Kafka metadata, and just, and uh, hybrid it on the other end. So that's the current state of the Kafka integration. Is there is no standard like W three C format for Kafka, and like there being a standard W three C format for HTTP headers. Yeah, I guess the other question is, well, the other question I would have is like, do you mean propagating context across Kafka, or do you mean like actually observing Kafka? Usually itself? people ask about propagating context across Kafka, but it definitely is true that I have had requests from the Kafka team to actually start figuring out how to instrument uh, Kafka itself with Hotel, which is a another entire other ball of wax. I think that it's better uh, to uh, do that at the Kafka layer rather than, uh, with instrumenting it with open telemetry rather than jury rigging it yourself. So yeah, so we hear the request. Yeah. So the other, the other thing is, if you go to the, if you actually there's a couple ways you can find out what integrations we have um, on that Open Telemetry website. There's a registry where you can kind of search and sort. Uh, you can also look at the GitHub pages for the each language. In general, um, Java probably has like the most support for integrations. Uh, to Tim. Snyder, yeah, Spring, Spring Boot. So there is a uh, integration for Spring and Spring Boot. Um, yeah, it's and... it's pretty mature. Um, yeah, actually, because I'll, it's, I'll it's actually descended. This. It's descended directly from Datadog's integration there, so it's pretty well tested. So if you go to the Open Telemetry GitHub page and you look at this is Open Telemetry Java instrumentation, and this has all of the Java stuff. So it's actually really straightforward to use this. I've done a lot of demos where you just bring this into your Docker container or whatever, you just integrate it in as a jar. Um, you can output to multiple formats. 
but down here at the bottom, we have a whole big list of every Java framework and library that's supported. So everything from AWS SDK, uh, Elasticsearch, Google HTTP, Grizzly, gRPC, Jetty, Kafka, the Kafka client is supported, um, Kubernetes client supported, Spring, WebMVC, Spring Data, Servlet, it's all there. Yeah, the in general, the way the packages are laid out is like there's the core. So like OpenTelemetry dash Java or OpenTelemetry dash Go dash Go are sort of the core API SDK, and then in a lot of cases, like con contributed things or things that move at a different cadence, I would say than the main line, are often like a contrib repo or automatic instrumentation or whatever. Um, I know like if you, if there's any Rubyists in the crowd, like a rails, uh, integrations in progress. Yeah. Right now Ruby is not officially listed as one of the hotel beta languages. We actually got some questions, I think earlier this week uh, about it, but if you're not, uh, it is, it is coming towards maturity. It just didn't make the initial list of five languages that we launched to beta with. Uh, yeah. it will make it for GA. Yes. So like, if you want, if you. If for more Go people, there's like Go Contrib has, you know, here's the instrumentation packages for Go. So it's less than some other languages, but also that's kind of Go. Um, there's just the third party ecosystem isn't quite what it is for, say, Java. Yep. And uh, there are Lightstep and Honeycomb integrations for JavaScript. So please do check those out. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Um, and we are at the end of our time. So I want to keep the conference moving on time. So thank you very yes. much for attending. And you know, again, please hit up those swag links. Uh, please feel free to check out the rest of the workshop. Um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your all things open. Yeah. Follow us on Twitter. I'm at Austin L. Parker. That's at Liz the Gray.